So we will start with some introductions. Um, my name is Caitlin Madkin. I use she, her pronouns. As a visual description, I am a white cisgender woman wearing black pants and a gray sweater, shoulder length, blonde hair, half of it up in a clip. Um, I am a third year PhD student in the Rehab Counselor Education Program, so I am deep in dissertation mode. Don't ask how it's going. Um, I also identify as somebody with a disability, one that has acquired, I have acquired over the last few years, um, which has greatly impacted my academic experience as a PhD student. Before coming back to school for my PhD, I graduated from UW with my master's in rehabilitation counseling, and I worked for several years supporting individuals with disabilities in various contexts, including working at the McBurney Disability Resource Center. Thank you. Uh, my name is Megan Baumunk, and uh, I'm also a third year dissertator in the Rehabilitation Counseling Education Program. Um, deep in dissertation, agree with all the sentiments. Uh, visual description, I'm a white cisgendered woman, um, use she, her pronouns. Uh, I have shoulder length blonde hair, I'm wearing, uh, I don't know what color glasses these are, tan glasses, sure, um, with a green blazer, a camel turtleneck, and blue jeans and boots. Um, I identify as having invisible disabilities, and um, it has impacted me in many ways, from career to uh, education, all of, all of the things. Um, and having invisible disabilities, experiencing that ableism in very um, kind of covert ways of not understanding when symptoms uh, arise and maybe needing to justify or, um, you know, being asked if they were real symptoms or, or things like this. So um, that's my experience with ableism. Thank you, Megan. Um, <clears throat> my name is Uzma Khan. Um, I am also a third year uh, student in the Rehabilitation Counselor Education Program and also working through my dissertation. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And the visual description is I'm cisgender brown with black hair, brown eyes, and I'm wearing a deep red sweater um, with some white stripes. Um, I also identify as someone with a disability. My disability is of neurodivergence um, related and it has um, caused issues, but also a lot of strengths. So that kind of ties in with my interests in disability identity. Um, and yeah, nice to meet you all. Tough to follow. Uh, Sitting next to wonderful people. Uh, last but not least, I'm Marcus Weathers Jr. Uh, common theme, I'm a third year. Uh, doctoral student in the Rehabilitation Counselor Education um, program. Let's see. I visually identify as an exhausted black male with short uh, black brownish hair. Um, I'm wearing an all black sweater, tan whitish pants, uh, black shoes. Uh, and I would say my experiences uh, with ableism, uh, being a first generation college student, I've just had to um, just learn how to navigate. Um, oh, I should have mentioned that I'm able bodied as well. Uh, so while it hasn't necessarily impacted me from a uh, disability standpoint, it certainly has affected me from a systems and a knowledge acquisition standpoint um, and has informed uh, some of my, my research interest as far as how ableism interacts with uh, racism and all the plethora of isms. But thank you all for coming. Thank you all. So to, to identify some themes and positionality among all of us, we are all students, um, as you can tell, but we are, have also served um, simultaneously as educators over the last three years. We have all um, independently and collaboratively taught undergrad and graduate level courses in our department. Um, we've also been students across multiple departments, not just the RPSE department. And we all have established different approaches to working with individuals with disabilities, but a commonality among all of us is that we follow a very critical approach. Um, coming from a rehabilitation counseling background, we we're trained to identify barriers and systematic challenges that are impacting individuals with disabilities and work to disrupt those. 
Um, one instructor told us um, in a class I took a few years ago that it is okay to critique the hand that feeds you, and all four of us very closely abide by that um, ideology, that it is okay to critique the, the systems that we benefit from, the systems that we teach in, in order to grow as educators and as students. And we also all view disability as just one of many uh, identities that intersect to create an individual. We see disability as an identity, although it might not be somebody's identity, they might not identify strongly with having a disability, but we see it as a necessary component to diversity um, to ensure that everybody has a seat and a voice at the table. So that's us. <laughs> um, we have a little poll just to get a sense of, of who's in the room, who's listening today. Um, hopefully all of you can access it. Um, so our question is, who are you? And the options are undergrad student, graduate student, educator or faculty member, a university staff member or other. And thank you for those of you joining us virtually. We appreciate it. Um, it seems like an overwhelming amount are university staff, and we have some students and other educators and faculty members um, in the room, in person and virtually. So that's really exciting to see. So before we get into our content on ableism, I want to, I want to preface it all with some important reminders um, because we can't cover everything in 55 minutes, although we really, really want to. Um, and ableism in teaching is something all of us could talk about for days. So we're gonna touch on some key general um, topics, but I also want to acknowledge some other very important factors related to disability. Um, so first, how we define disability matters. Uh, the legal definition of disability uh, defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act, is an impairment that substantially impacts a major life activity. This definition is pretty specific, and in order for somebody to be diagnosed um, is sometimes a challenge in and of itself. We know that there are a plethora of barriers for somebody to even get a diagnosis, and there are very large implications if you don't have an established diagnosed disability as a student on campus. Um, second, the experience of undergrad and graduate students is going to differ. Uh, the needs are different, the standards, responsibilities, the roles within departments, it's all going to differ. So keep that in mind when, when we're thinking about maybe who you're interacting with, the ableism experienced by each of those groups is likely also going to be different. Third, um, ableism experiences are gonna depend on the disability. Frequently, you might hear the comparison of apparent versus non-apparent disabilities, or um, of, often also referred to as visible versus invisible. Those apparent disabilities are ones that are more visually apparent to you, whereas the non-apparent or invisible disabilities are, are more internal and you're not likely to see those. Similarly, um, somebody with a physical disability is gonna have different ableist experiences than somebody with a chronic health condition. That's a pretty classic example of apparent versus non-apparent disabilities. And it's also important to remember that even if we're comparing those groups, the differences within each group is also going to be different. Everybody with a chronic health condition is going to experience it differently. Um, additionally, we want to recognize that ableism is highly connected to racism both ableism and racism cannot be discussed without recognizing the other. They both influence and are, they influence and are influenced by each other. We, both historically and currently, we're gonna try to focus our discussion on ableism, of course, but we're also going to work to embed racism and, and other intersecting isms that come up um, as much as possible. And then lastly, we want to highlight that faculty-student relationship. This is something that all four of us have observed firsthand, both as an instructor and as a student. 
We've seen how that relationship can directly impact uh, an individual's learning experience, both positively and negatively. And that is, that's been seen on all of us firsthand. It's also very apparent in the literature, and it's also been highlighted in the UW-Madison Campus Climate Survey, the one that came out in 2016 and 2021. Both highlighted that faculty can directly influence how well-respected individuals with disabilities feel in the classroom. Additionally, a lot of accommodations are sometimes up to the discretion of the instructor for how they're going to be implemented and what they're going to look like, which again is gonna directly impact that faculty-student relationship. So we're, we're really highlighting that, that value that comes from that relationship, both good and bad, and, and working to make it as good as possible. Um, so here's a here's a broad. Actually, I love this definition um, of ableism from uh, Black advocate uh, T. Talila L. Lewis or T. L. Lewis. Um, that reads: Ableism is a system of assigning value to people's bodies and minds based on societal constructed ideas of normalcy, productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness. Uh, these constructed ideas are deeply rooted in eugenics, anti-blackness, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. Um, so essentially speaking, um, ableism is a structural phenomenon that uh, bases the way we build our societies, um, and universities are actually the perfect example as how we structure some of our values uh, as far as high achieving, being hyper-competitive, our interactions, um, and other false meritocracies that uh, essentially note that we should be perfect. Um, and I'm sure we all feel that in certain ways, ableism is sometimes also reframed or masked as like mental health crises that <laughs> students are experiencing or burnout. Um, and it's very pervasive and once again, just been repackaged in different ways in which we look at the individuals rather than the system of uh, ableism and white supremacy, essentially uh, kind of capturing this experience. Uh, that being said, the systematic oppression uh, leads to people and society just determining values based on um, people's culture, their age, language, appearance, um, all of these salient identities that you all have that we also uh, shared earlier. Um, and also just places, sac uh, looks at sac satisfactory uh, um, value of um, excellence and uh, what's deemed as like appropriate behavior. Um, I think one of the things uh, to also take away from all this is that uh, similar to like what I shared earlier is that you don't have to be disabled to experience ableism. Um, we all experience it in, once again, very different or pervasive ways. Um, and highly recommend if you are um, interested in this literature uh, to check out J. Timothy Dolmage's uh, book, Academic Ableism. Um, in which he starts to um, compare and contrast the, the notion of ableism, which is this value of excellence and productivity and all the things you can think of in the university setting versus uh, disableism, which reads as a set of assumptions, uh, whether they be conscious or unconscious and practices that promote the differential or unequal treatment of people because of actual or presumed disabilities. Um, and once again, this is something that we are very privy to very young um, and whether we know it or not when we have our general public education versus like special education um, once again personally i would frame it as a, a conversation a conversation around uh, segregation as far as um, essentially just devaluing and dehumanizing uh, and continuing to uh, stigma uh, stigmatize individuals with disabilities uh, and allow for you know, political ways uh, to appropriate discrimination against uh, uh, against individuals with disability. Um, so, what's what I found interesting while reading this literature? One moment. Yeah, is that uh, the two work together uh, because it's ableism that allows us to once again devalue disabled people, um, and then it's also ableism that structures a world in which it's very difficult to admit maybe when we fail, uh, when we struggle. Um, it's difficult to admit that success is not necessarily easy and um, privilege is not fairly distributed. Um, 
So in addition to uh, that, oh, forgot, this is, yeah. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, so academic ableism leads us to believe that there are specific bodies and minds that uh, do not have a, a right to uh, be at the university. And so I think, uh, once again, a great example of this was within the book, he uh, highlights this postcard in which there are the, it's like a mountain of stairs. If you uh, are familiar with like Rocky and the, like the steps, it's just this mountain of stairs and behind it is the university. And it looks like an older postcard, but um, once again, it's just what, uh, it's that messaging of once again, who belongs at the university. It's not like it was, um, the structure and the stairs kind of create this environment that once again kind of highlights uh, who's allowed access and who should be attending um, once again these universities um, and what are some of the standards and the norms uh, that once again we, we uphold and not only that we uphold but we also internalize and start to normalize um, um, at the, in the university setting. Um, so many post-secondary institutions continue to follow uh, an individualized medical model of disability, um, which is reflected in their policies and practice, uh, practices that isolate and stigmatize people with disabilities who require uh, workplace accommodations. Essentially, what I'm highlighting here is that uh, more often than not, to receive, I can't speak for McBurney, so I won't, uh, but to receive um, accommodations, um, more often than not, there is uh, necessary or required proof to um, discuss maybe how this disability uh, impairs maybe your functioning or your participation, and rather than, once again, uh, accommodating the environment, well, rather than accommodating the environment to fit the needs of everybody, we kind of single somebody else we single somebody out and we um, once again have them disclose what maybe their ability status is and then um, hopefully uh, provide them with the necessary accommodations to help them achieve uh, just successful participation in uh, once again our, our curriculum and things of that nature. Uh, and then one of the things I came across in two different systematic uh, systematic reviews where that disability has arguably less uh, received much less attention compared to other equity deserving groups uh, within uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, so I want to say certainly once again a, a quick plug. If you are interested in in all things related ableism, um, Gregor Wolbring does a lot of um, a lot of research. Uh, he's over in Canada and he looked at uh, assist. Essentially, with the systematic review, he uh, plugged the literature to see kind of what would come up when he included equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, as and then he the an extra word, not an extra word, but disability was also highlighted. So he whittled his search down from thousands of articles to essentially twelve, um, and then within the twelve, four of those twelve were actually. Um, prominently highlighting the importance of talking about disability and more centered and themed around disability, whereas a, a common pattern he highlighted was that um, a lot of times when we think of EDI or DEI, however you want to frame it, um, a lot of the initiatives or focuses go more towards um, gender or race and ethnic mi minoritized groups rather than, once again, foregrounding or, uh, or giving more attention to uh, disabilities, which uh, I'm sure, as like we know, uh, people with disabilities make up uh, the largest minority group, um, but are continuously like left out of the conversation of DEI. So. Um, and then, with that being said, um, so faculty and staff with disabilities are significantly underrepresented within academia and experience alarming rates of discrimination, social exclusion, and mar marginalization. Um, so once again, there's a lot more research that's, uh, or at least in these literature reviews that I was finding um, for Canada, Australia, and I want to say the UK. Um, so one of them highlighted that the proportion of staff in universities declaring health conditions or impairments rose from 2.2 .2 in 2003 to 3.9 in 2012. Uh, so we are seeing that uh, increase in people um, declaring or at least disclosing that they are living with uh, a dis disability or a health condition. Um, however, um, 
big databases, uh, well, their big database uh, um, mentioned that at least 16% of working age adults uh, and nearly 13% of undergraduates also have a known disability. So I think one of the common themes across the literature was highlighting this uh, idea of whether or not disclosure is actually whether or not there's actually space for disclosure and what disclosure actually looks like. And once again, it goes back to whether or not we're creating spaces uh, in which people feel safe and aren't um, being kind of singled out for their, their levels or statuses of ability. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, Lindsay and Fuentes identified uh, themes of negative, negative physical and mental health concerns along with impacting an individual's career development. Uh, some of the studies, so this was uh, the other systematic review uh, in which uh, some studies focused on physical and psychological harm due to lack of accommodations. Um, I think it's uh, um, important to highlight that uh, more often than not, individuals living with uh, a health condition or a disability um, most likely have more, uh, will have more than one or experiencing more than one. Um, and um, let me see. And in addition to that, um, other studies when, when providing and actually offering um, um, accommodations uh, mentioned how the one-size-fits-all approach uh, based on performance metrics uh, could negatively impact the career development and health and well-being of academics with, it, with disabilities. Um, so some of the things they, they highlighted there are, once again, in the, academic, uh, in the, the climate of academia, we, we highlight and we value hyper-competitiveness. Um, and one of the things uh, that stood out to me was that whether or not uh, people not only didn't feel comfortable like receiving or even asking for um, some of these uh, accommodations, but they were, um, bless you, uh, they were also just, when, when receiving uh, accommodations, they weren't receiving uh, necessary or appropriate accommodations that kind of fit their needs. Um, once again, going back to that one size fits all and this should be good enough, uh, which is rooted in a lot of the ableist attitudes and practices we kind of uphold at these uh, universities. So. Awesome, thank you. So I'm gonna jump into the role of the educators um, and how to remove ableism and support students. And that is a lofty title page. Um, as Caitlin mentioned earlier, we're, we're not going to be able to give like the step-by-step -step guide of how to remove ableism, right? Um, it is a continuing conversation that we have to remember that it's a growth mindset journey um, and we have to continue to learn and grow and, and just do better as we go on. Um, now, I'm clicking for everybody else. Let's see if I can manage my own. Um, it's doubtful. So I first want to acknowledge the complexity of the role of an educator. Um, I really wanted to compare it to an onion, but onions just make you cry and they're kind of spicy. And then that felt really accurate uh, when I was grading papers, so maybe yes, maybe no. Um, maybe like a good Danish, that's nice and layered. So um, understanding that we mean a lot to not only us as an educator, we have a lot of expectations of ourselves, um, expectations of the university, and what students expect of us. Um, laundry list. But I want to start with a few questions. So what is legally required of educators um, and the university? Uh, where does ableism live within the classroom? Uh, how does the educator support students while maintaining a constructive learning environment? Who needs accommodations? And why should I consider universal design? So starting the conversation where most of us, whether we're university staff, educators, or students, where we start the conversation about a classroom is the syllabus. Um, this is a sample syllabus statement from the McBurney uh, Disability Resource Center. This will sound like a 15 minute commercial for McBurney, just throwing that out there, this is unpaid. Um, but I want to just toss out a couple of, of things that will be echoed through the rest of this um, conversation. So our legislation and our university policy require that university uh, provide reasonable accommodations to students with disabilities to access and participate in 
academic programs and educational services. This is a joint responsibility. Um, students are expected to inform their faculty for the need of accommodations. And disability information, including accommodations, are part of their uh, confidential, covered by FERPA um, educational record. So another kind of just logistical thing, um, from McBurney's standpoint, uh, they have this really wonderful uh, page showing all of the roles within the accommodation process. And so technically speaking, the bare minimum, um, I'm not gonna read all of these bullet points, don't worry, uh, but faculty will be notified of the accommodations. They may reach out to the students to discuss how to implement those accommodations. Um, students who go directly to faculty can be referred to the McBurney uh, Resource Center in case there's a deeper conversation that needs to be had. Um, that conversation may be more effective going through the the McBurney Center. Um, of course, faculty are responsible for implementing these accommodations in a timely manner. Important to note, they're not obligated to retroactively implement if the accommodations come halfway through the semester. Um, that would be up to the discretion of the faculty uh, member. And then if faculty do uh, disagree with the accommodation or are unsure, um, they can meet with the McBurney represent the representative of the accommodation. There's a contact list. And those are fantastic conversations to really uh, get ideas on how to implement, but if it's justified in this, this way. Um, and that's uh, if faculty are looking to not approve um, an accommodation for any reason, having that additional conversation with McBurney um, would be recommended. So stepping back to kind of more of a globally uh, important context, what are the guiding principles of these like technical what is our role? Um, we are legally required to provide accommodations. Um, the legislation determining that, uh, really starting with the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA of 1990. Um, this was the comprehensive civil rights law prohibiting discrimination um, on the basis of disability. Uh, the ADA Amendments Act, or my favorite, the ADAAA um, of 20, 2008, sure, 2008, I don't know. Um, the important piece of that is that it broadened the definition of disability, and it provided more individuals, um, more students with uh, more services and more protections because that, that umbrella got bigger. So someone who may not have um, been protected previously fell under that umbrella easier with um, the broader definition of disability. Another important piece of the ADA is Title II, um, and this is the state and local government um, being required to give people with disabilities equal opportunity to benefit from all of program services and activities. This includes things like employment, transportation, but specifically public uh, education in our context anyways. So the next important piece uh, is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This uh, covers federal contractors and programs receiving federal funds. Um, but the, the most important piece of uh, the Rehab Act of 73, if I can say so so confidently, is the Section 504. Um, and this forbids organizations and employers from excluding and denying individuals with disabilities um, an equal opportunity to receive program benefits and services. So logistically, those are, I did it to myself too, uh, those are the important pieces of uh, legislation. So the other piece um, of 504 that was uh, important, we'll see it in a lot of verbiage, is this qualified individual with disability. And as someone with a disability, uh, like that just makes me kind of shudder, like what is a qualified individual with disability? Um, but definition wise, it's a person with a disability who is capable of fulfilling the essential functions and requirements of the educational program or activity with or without reasonable accommodations. And I think that reframe is really important um, when we're thinking about what reasonable accommodations are, we're looking at with or without. So moving into the accommodations, um, we see the, the phrasing reasonable accommodations, and this is defined in the ADA Title I, um, and it's basically accommodations and modifications to ensure that people with disabilities can interact, understand, and engage with said thing, right? Um, 
I had a really important point, and it's gone. But anyways, so that's what reasonable uh, uh, accommodations are. Ooh, undue hardship is what I wanted to point out. So um, when we say something is unreasonable, it's typically because that provides undue hardship onto the employer, the university, um, the entity that is providing the accommodations. It's typically in um, how difficult is it to implement, what is the cost, and what is the nature of the organization. So the size, um, their resources, things like that. Um, if it puts too much pressure on the entity, it may be deemed as unreasonable. So what I've heard from my students um, in previous conversations about accommodations, when they come and talk to me, these are the phrases that they have been told that their accommodation requests are. And it was so disheartening. Um, so being very clear, reasonable accommodations are not an easy way out. They are not an unfair advantage, nor are they an excuse um, to not do something. Reasonable accommodations ensure students with disabilities are not denied or excluded from the benefits of a course, activity, or a program. Simply all students should have the access to an equitable learning environment, um, and it's on us to be able to do that. So reasonable accommodations do not lower the standards. Um, they don't change the skill uh, or the knowledge of the course or program. It's part of, the, part of the, the expectation of a reasonable accommodation is that it doesn't change the learning objective of that activity or that course, um, which can be a, a nice guidance when we're trying to decide if, if an accommodation can be implemented or not. Um, they do not fundamentally alter the nature of the activity or the course, and of course, they do not create an undue burden to the university. And um, any of the quotes beyond my students' quotes, um, and the accommodations do not, are directly from our university policy. So one of the things that we do as instructors is we discuss accommodations. Um, and the uh, more common accommodations that I have seen are like testing time increases, right? We see time and a half and, and two times for exams, note-taking services, sign language interpreting, media captioning, um, flexible due dates and or attendance. Um, this can also look like modifications to assignments like public speaking um, or access to course material early um, or in specific formats. Um, there are uh, a lot of, piece of pieces of advice to how to make those things more accessible on the, on the upfront of your course design. Um, and I'll give a plug later for that. Um, but when I'm talking about accommodations and seeing how these common accommodations might fit into my course, I start asking questions. Um, and I'm going to have you consider these questions uh, from an educator standpoint of what is reasonable? How do we determine that? So how will the accommodation impact the intended purpose of the activity or assignment? Um, again, using those learning objectives to kind of guide that that process. Um, if I'm having reservations about implementing an accommodation, why? Do I fear that it's going to change the learning objective? Um, or is it somewhere else, stemming from somewhere else? Um, where is this discomfort stemming from? So it's it can be a very uncomfortable self-reflection moment. Um, but I think it's a very important one. And I think it's an important one. I don't think that's a but. Um, and then this all brings us down to this very simple question of, is my course designed with inclusivity in mind? And when learning objectives are considered as the guiding principles, we have to really analyze those for the potentially implicit or inherent ableist uh, uh, underpinnings of those learning objectives um, and what other isms could be uh, coming into those learning objectives. So. There's this another uncomfy conversation that has to come up when we talk about accommodations, and it is the process of disability disclosure. Um, I've heard from a lot of students that they have been pressured to disclose, they've been asked to disclose their specific disability, and I'm already seeing like shakes of the head and eye rolls, and so safe space to say you, that's not okay. Um, students are not required to disclose their specific disability. That is confidential information that they do not have to disclose. When I have conversations about accommodations with students, it's one of my opening lines of, please only tell me what you are comfortable telling me. That is your information. So students may struggle to balance that 
desire to kind of justify the accommodations um, because of the, the underlying stigma that accommodations have. Uh, but then balancing that maintaining personal boundaries. How do I tell you I need an accommodation without over uh, disclosing? A good example of why a specific dis disability is not necessary is when you're consulting with McBurney, um, they will only share the absolute necessary information and rarely does it include a disability uh, uh, diagnosis. I can't say in any of my discussions has a specific diagnosis ever been named. Um, so when we're thinking about disability disclosure, some questions to consider. Um, if, you're, if you're looking for that disclosure piece is what is the purpose of asking for students to disclose their disability? Pretty basic question, but what, why are we asking this? I think it's from the best of intent of how can I best support this student? The more information I have, the better I can do. And I think that takes a very medical model approach to disability. If I know the label, I know how to help. It's so important to remember that disability is so unique and it's an individual experience that just because we know the label, we do not know their experience with this disability. So what is the purpose? I think this will then lead to how will that information help me as the instructor or the TA uh, support this student? So it's not the disability label, it's what do they need from me? How does this accommodation help support that student have an equitable learning experience? then what information am I truly seeking in that disability disclosure? And I think that that will funnel out all of the, the questions there. So the question we could probably spend seven hours just talking about is how do we balance determining what is reasonable while acknowledging the presence of ableism? And I feel like this, this was a question that it was like that we are gonna answer this question and Nope. Um, so this is too big of a question to uh, answer in a 55 minute presentation, right? Part of the guiding principles I think it, that we can use are those learning objectives, but understanding how ableist those learning objectives can be. Um, so moving away from the learning objectives, a potential partial solution um, is the concept of universal design. As Marcus said, um, there isn't a one size fits all. Similarly, with that label, um, we're not going to be able to have uh, uh, how this accommodation request gets implemented, and that's the only way we ever implement that accommodation request. It needs to be individualized to every student, and even if we are completely universally designed, there will still be extra things that we have to do as educators to ensure students are getting a universal experience. So backing up from universal design quickly, um, something we learn in pedagogy and, and <laughs> teaching practices is that all students learn in different ways. We don't shy away from that fact when we're talking about pedagogy. That is why we have different activities, different types of activities. We create our, our courses to engage various types of learning um, automatically. It's, it's what we should be doing. However, when we bring disability into it, sometimes that's when people start to back up and say, well, I've already tried to be inclusive with learning styles, but a true inclusive classroom must consider disability um, and all of the systemic issues that come along with that. Um, universal design uh, is, is a fundamental condition of good design. So it allows for environments um, to be accessed, used, and uh, understood to the greatest extent by all people possible. Um, and universal design exists in all spaces. Uh, my favorite example is curb cuts. So when you're walking on the sidewalk and that curb dips, it's curb cut. Uh, it's my favorite. I don't know why I get all nerdy about uh, curb cuts. It's fine. We won't go into it. Uh, but Take a stroller down a sidewalk without a curb cut. Have fun. This is why it's universal design, because it helps many people, it helps most people um, uh, use and, and ex access that uh, sidewalk. So we're combining usable, accessible, and inclusive, and you'll see this uh, described in a few different imagery ways, like Venn diagrams, triangles, right? That centerpiece of usable, accessible, and inclusive is that universal design. 
Universally designed elements benefit disabled and non-disabled persons. I think the best example, the best comparable um, is uh, employment. Workplaces that have effectively implemented accommodations are safer. All employees have fewer work-related injuries and uh, all employees are more productive with accommodations in place. So it's, it's pushing that employer to a more universally designed setup uh, by implementing those accommodations. Similarly, students uh, with or without an official accommodation request and with or without an official diagnosis, because we know what diagnosis uh, can take, and it's not always going to happen for all students. It provides all students with more accessible learning experiences. And here is my final shameless plug. Um, McBurney offers a stellar training on how to make your classroom more accessible. Um, I have worked one-on-one -on -one with many McBurney individuals of how to make accessible PowerPoints, how to do accessible Word docs, and by making my PowerPoints more accessible, it's not only helping students with screen readers, it's helping students with um, different learning styles that aren't disability related. We're giving them more options to engage with the coursework, to really let them be the director of how they engage with that uh, classroom. So that's, that's my plug. And it's so easy, it's so easy. McBurney will set you up. Oh, the question was, wasn't uh, plain language a big part of that as well? Absolutely. Plain language is, is so important. Um, and I think that's part of that, like academic ableism and, and how uh, non-plain language, academic language, uh, that jargon impacts so many populations um, and, and student communities. That, that's a great point. Um, so... I guess talking about how disability is still not universally understood as a civil rights initiative and what ends up happening is that disability is not considered uh, when we're trying to diversify and decolonize curriculum in higher education settings. Then what further happens is that when we're talking about disrupting established hierarchies and talking about the hidden curriculum, we're still promoting the powerlessness and marginalization of disabled people because we're not including them there. And then what further happens as educators is that if we don't engage in this observation or reflection on, like we talked about with language right now, um, on the pedagogical concerns in delivering teaching, then we're historically serving models that support traditional neuro and physiotypical ableism. And that's why we have our presentation, we're questioning the rationale for this, and we're aiming to have a discussion on common practices and assumptions um, and can challenge all of that. So according to Greenstein, who has um, devised the radical inclusive pedagogy, um, talks about disabled students becoming in the world with others and how they have shared the world and the world has shared them. So thinking about how has the world shared the narrative of disabled students and, and how has the world been shared with them and understanding the inequities that arise in that, um, in that aspect. So then we go back to thinking about a radical inclusive pedagogy and, and becoming in the world with others um, where we're not just creating provision for disabled students, we're not like oh, you need more time for a quiz and I'm gonna provide you that time. We're stepping back and we're planning and recognizing that we are all differently embodied and positioned in this world. And going back and starting from that radical inclusive pedagogy in the first place, rather than having to kind of band-aid our way into providing accommodations and teaching our students with disabilities. Um, then again, the question comes in, are we training those with differences to simply fit in with problematic foundations that construct disability averse knowledges and practices in the first place? So are we training those with differences to kind of fit into this preset models um, that already have disability averse knowledge and practice? Um, inclusive education is not inclusive if it accentuates differences. When people are put into boxes and environments that already have exclusive views and methods, 
They're not being included. Um, and then we need to understand that inclusive education is about supporting our students to construct their own meaning and their goals from what they're learning and by adjusting the material environment and engaging in a dialogue instead of um, a different model of education where they're a vessel and you're just um, imparting education onto them. You have to think of your students as someone that you, you can engage in a dialogue with that mutually defines this pedagogy, this mutually defines this teaching practice and the culture in the classroom. Okay, so to talk about this culture in the classroom, we need to talk about biases that come up. And I'm gonna give you kind of like a quick one-on-one on cognitive biases and how they exist and show up, just so we can understand how they can show up in the classroom and how they impact us on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, we have judgment heuristics, which are quick mental shortcuts, um, automatic, often unconscious, just like half a second um, to get to them. Then we have the availability heuristic, which is where whichever information is the easiest for us to recall, we make decisions and judgments on that. The representative heuristic is when people are identifying problems and features as a representation of things that are already existing. Now, if we go back to our system where disability is not included, where we don't have that much knowledge about disability, think about how these availability and representative heuristics appear for us. Um, understanding that it is inherently ableist um, to not have these present in the first place. Um, so the non-existence of these representative relationships is what will lead to these illusory correlations. And in like making our decisions and treating our students from a lens of justice, that will be absent because we will be making assumptions based on the ableist education that we've had. Um, so that kind of leads to confirmatory bias, where one confirms an initial understanding as opposed to considering alternative and disconfirming explanations. Then we have fundamental attribution error, where educators are providing undue weight to internal factors as opposed to considering situational or environmental factors when forming judgments about disabled students and their needs. Next slide. So how does this kind of show up in the classroom? So thinking about, okay, we all have biases, uh, we have these mental shortcuts that help us make decisions and we already don't have the information that we need to be anti-ableist. Um, so this can show up as lowered expectations. Um, there's unknowingly, educators could have lower expectations for their students and assume that they're not capable of meeting the same academic standards as their peers without disabilities. This leads to limited opportunities and limited support for these students to excel. Then we have microaggressions where there's unintentional microaggression or intentional where you're making comments or actions that convey these subtle and discriminatory messages um, by like ableist language, so like making language more difficult and making assumptions about a student based on their disability. There's an overemphasis on normalcy where unconscious biases will prioritize a perceived notion of normalcy over individualized approaches. There's resistance to accommodation, unwillingness to acknowledge the diverse needs of students. Um, and then we have stereotyping and labeling where educators may unknowingly stereotype students based on assuming certain characteristics of them without considering the unique strengths and abilities um, that they bring to the table. Some of this can show up in the ignorance of universal design. We just learned about universal design, how convenient it is, how inclusive it is, how it like it just gives us a sigh of relief in like, okay, you know, like things are considered. Um, I feel like I'm a part of this society. And that can lead to exclusion from participation. There are some assignments that students can't participate in. Um, and there's the ignoring of intersectionality and the social position that the students may have in the classroom while talking about certain topics or by including them um, in, in class. Okay, so you must be wondering, why is cultural humility here? Um, and the reason why cultural humil humility is here, because I believe that you have to search deep within yourself to find the words that articulate your practice onto paper. 
So we talked about how pedagogy is something that needs to be looked at, observed, and criticized, because we are all believers in, in criticizing uh, education and, and improving it and making it better for us to learn, and that involves cultural humility. Cultural competence is our ability to um, learn about different racial, social, economic, ethnic, religious, social groups, and we're always working towards it. It's an ongoing process. It, it's like, oh, I can learn as much about a culture that I can. But cultural humility is an ongoing process of self-exploration and self-critique, which is combined with a willingness to learn from others, where there is you're honoring their beliefs, you're honoring their customs and values. How this shows up in disability is as an educator, you recognize that you're going to fail, but you're going to fail forward. As Paulo Friers talks about in this principle of conscientization, that was a difficult word, um, but it talks about having a critical awareness of yourself and behavior and being conscious about who we're interacting with. So in terms of teaching, Friere talks about how we all acquire social myths that, have, that are dominant in, in our learnings and how learning is a critical process which depends on uncovering real problems in the classroom. And we can't be anti-ableist if we don't have a lens for uncovering these problems that are emanating in the classroom. So then, again, the question comes in, how do we practice cultural humility against ableism? And that's one question that we want to think is that we're going to fail, but it's better for us to fail forward and keep learning rather than assume competence over something that we can't answer in 55 minutes. So, yeah. Um, so some recommendations are to, again, going on that whole questioning basis talking about how achieving good teaching requires the teacher's judgment and reflection on their own teaching, which is based on three fundamental questions. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? And how are we doing it? Now you may think that, okay, these are really basic questions, but in going ahead, it's about being truthful in our values, in our beliefs, and being just and fair to our students, engaging independent thought, action, and courage that is required to change conventional educational practices that are ableist. It's necessary. As Krober talks about, sometimes thinking about the authentic, authenticity of teaching, um, questioning the accepted practice of others, and suggesting a revision of ideas, it's a process that involves risk. It involves bravery, stamina, tenacity, to be setting out alone, guided by a belief in justice, in being accurate to who we are and who our students are. So we have to have a resolute purpose if we're diverging from these entrenched templates of teaching and practice, if we are to be just to our students. Um, Boderick talks about the framework for inclusivity in education. We talked about how classrooms are not inclusive if there's not disabilities not present in them. We can't have di inclusion without disability. Talking about the what, the why, the who, and the how of education. So the what of education, uh, sorry, the what of inclusion um, means uh, that the search for justice means equal opportunities for expanding individual capabilities. The why of inclusion is the capabilities and skills that are developed through inclusion, which are some academic skills, technical skills, life skills, autonomy, the ability to choose, respect for evolving skills, respect for inherent dignity, for your self-worth, and a voice and participation in learning. Um, then we go on to the who of inclusion, and that's about developing skills from a person-centered approach um, and of every individual learner that is in your class. And then you're like, okay, how do we do this? The how of inclusion is talking about recognizing that there's a conflict between focusing on the characteristics of difference. So first thinking about, okay, we're including these disabled students as an afterthought. We have to change that. We have to think about, um, instead of like focusing on the characteristic of differences or ignoring differences in an attempt to provide equality in educational experiences, we need to focus on needs and strengths. Um, the capability and skills approach addresses this difficulty when you widen the normative um, perspective. 
you reflect human diversity, you reflect differences, and you reflect the range of different learning abilities, talents, learning styles, and personality that are linked to the educational curriculum. So thinking about how not to go in from a fact that, okay, this is not something that I know uh, I have to honor equal opportunity in this class and therefore I'm going to focus in on what I've learned for like years and years and years, but focusing in on the strengths that students bring in the class, the needs that they have in your classroom, and having an open mind and, and failing forward. So um, yeah, with that we conclude our presentation and um, we are open for questions. Thank you all for that talk, it was really informative. So I'm still kind of confused what UW Madison's policy is. Because you kind of stated that it's at the faculty's discretion and then you stated that McBurney Disability Center has all these things available to faculty. So who really has the final say? And this becomes kind of complex because then what if the relationship between a faculty member and a student is not really that good? Or maybe it's misunderstood. Uh, personally, I have cerebral palsy and I've, 95% of the time people have called it a disease and they think cerebral palsy is the same thing as muscular dystrophy and MS, which is totally incorrect. Thank you. Do you have an answer? Yeah. I, I saw, like, let me answer this question, because I think that's a really phenomenal question of, like, who does decide? Um, but yeah, hi. My name is Kyle Charters. I see him, his pronouns. I'm the Associate Director of Student Services in the McBurney Disability Resource Center. Um, and so uh, UW Policy 855 um, says that instructors are in charge of implementing the accommodations in the classroom, right? They will receive a student accommodation letter that says what accommodations a student is approved for. Um, and it is their responsibility to then implement those accommodations while being supported by the McBurney Center if they have any questions about how or if they do have questions about whether or not a specific accommodation is reasonable based on the design of their course, the learning objectives and those types of things, they always need to consult with the McBurney Center because we would be um, in consultation with the instructor and learning about the class and why there are concerns. Um, whether or not the request is reasonable or not. But we would be the experts in the reasonableness of that, and we don't want to put that pressure um, on an instructor because they are not experts in reasonableness. They're likely experts on the content and maybe experts on instruction, but reasonableness is a very disability-specific um, context. So that was a great question, and I'm glad that I could answer it. So there was a follow-up question, just who has the final say about whether an accommodation is reasonable or not? The McBurney Center would have the final say on whether an accommodation is reasonable or not. I almost feel that you should have the microphone for this next question, so it's gonna go right back to you, unless someone else can answer. Um, I work in a department where faculty at times are not reasonable. Um, but I also, you know, work with them to try to understand what that means. And there are sometimes where I'm like, I, I, I don't know. Let's talk to McBurney. My question surrounds the flexibility letter. Can you dive more into that and how it should really be used or how it should be used? And then, like, the time differential. It usually comes up with, you know, it's a day before or it's 12 hours before an exam. And the student sends an email to the instructor, the instructor gets it the next morning, the student said, I can't, I can't take the exam. The faculty feels that's unreasonable. I try to reason, which is funny, with faculty at times, and share with them, well, well clearly they weren't feeling like this 18 hours before the exam, it's emerging 12 hours before the exam. And that they, the request is, I'd like an extension, I wanna take the exam another time, the instructor th thinks that's unreasonable, um, and they cite, there are other students that are taking the exam, Tracy, and 
they want that feedback within 24 to 48 hours. Help me out on this. I mean, I I hate to like put you on the spot. I I think well. Yeah. To to avoid our our co-presenter, and if I'm wrong, throw something heavy. Um, I think my my first question is is how are we defining flexible and and that that kind of this is going to sound way harsher than I mean it, but that ableist lens of you have to know your symptomology, you have to be able to predict your flares. That's not something reasonable um, for something that requires a flexible schedule or flexible due dates is not predictable. So pushing that that envelope to the faculty to say we, we have to expect the unexpected and being flexible is just that. Um, and, and I don't think that probably solves your question with the faculty, but understanding that we cannot predict what our schedule would look like, what that participation would look like because of the need for flexible accommodations. Like that is why it's there. So I don't I don't know if there's if there's a, a legitimate policy saying you have to use a, a certain time ahead, but I think that's a a, a silly assumption that I would push back on. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, chat too? I'll, I'll walk back here. You guys get the, the question up here and then I'll wait for, yep, okay. So um, in, the, in the chat, it, it's been very robust in the chat. Uh, someone said, recently I was a student and I was approached by a TA who pressured me to not use my accommodation because it would look unfair. What training do TAs receive? <laughs> so I think, let me see. I, there is TA training in the summer, like a little weeks before, um, Weeks before the semester starts, but uh, funny enough, dis disability and accommodations are not incorporated, oddly enough, in that training, even though they're attached to all the accommodation letters and things of that. So once again, just going back to some of the policies and the practices, it's one of those things where disability is a natural human experience and should be just automatically assumed to be in the training. So if anybody out there hosting the TA training um, is listening, hopefully that's a consideration and recommendation. But yeah, I can say in my experience when becoming a TA, they teach you how to work Canvas. They teach you the technicalities of maneuvering Canvas, but the conversation about disability is not really brought up until like we now have instructor roles and now we meet with our faculty advisors. And I wanna be very clear, we're coming from a world where we're like passionate about disability and we recognize that other, um, other disciplines do not necessarily have the same passion or focus, which is odd, but neither here nor there. I'm sorry to hear that was your experience though. Hi, um, I have more of a, <clears throat> excuse me, I have more of a comment, but um, I think that I work for UHS partially, and so we'll see a lot of academic majors, music majors, dance majors, and their like ability status changes throughout their time here. And whether that's temporary or more of a chronic injury, like I've heard of professors trying to pe get people to change their major if they're like a junior and they like oh they're having this chronic wrist issue they're like told they shouldn't be a music major anymore and it's really frustrating because this concept of fairness and what's fair to students is so changing and i think that like our ability status between our life can change and i think ability status, like 30% of people will become disabled, you know, in their life. And whether that's temporary or chronic changes. And I think this idea of fairness is so not equitable. And it just reminds me of like, well, what is actually fair and like what the learning objectives are 
does not change whether they take the exam on this Thursday or next Thursday, the learning objective is still there. So why, why is there this concept of fairness that it has to be completed at the same time as everybody else? And I just, it's a concept that I just can't wrap my mind around, but it's just like something that this whole presentation has brought up. So I felt like I needed to share it. If anyone has any other comments or, you know, advice that would be welcomed for sure. Yeah, um, thank you for sharing um, your comment. I think it's a very important and a very profound question on asking what is fairness. And I just wanted to recognize the fact that the lack of inclusion of disability in pedagogy is impacting us in these ways where people are being asked to change their majors because they can't be accommodated on the onset of a disability or a difficulty that they might be experiencing because this curriculum and the system is not designed to be able to kind of make up for that or with inclusion including that in mind so we have to kind of go back to our our pedagogies and our teaching practices in how we um, talk about those when designing curriculums from a higher departmental um, and systemic level uh, so that when you encounter difficulties it's not about oh you should change your major I can't accommodate your request to take this quiz on Thursday it should more be like okay how am I delivering this teaching practice according to this learning objective and how does this student fit in with that R regardless of any changes in their ability at any point in time. Um, it's that design of the curriculum and how the professor is, is teaching is what needs to change. Yeah, I, I yeah. still on, right? I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Uzma said. And I, I also want to, I thought of two things from, from your thought. One, McBurney does support temporary disabilities. Um, just as a PSA. And second, what I have found as a student with a chronic health condition and watching students with chronic health conditions, they flare when stress is high. Um, that's finals, midterms, when everything is piling up and crumbling down, that's when I'm, that's when I'm down. And that's when I need the most flexibility. And I think that from what I've seen as an educator is very true of students as well. And as, as instructors, it's, it's hard because it's finals. We have to get grades in. And we don't, have time to, we don't have time to field 15 flexibility requests. So I think it's, um, there, I have so many thoughts. But those are, the, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I think we have time for like one, maybe two more questions or, or comments. This may be a heated question, <laughs> or loaded. Um, I would really like to understand your perspectives about how, like if exams in general, in person, are equitable. Um, just from the perspective of, one with the pandemic and everything being online and at least from my perspective, I work in the Physics Learning Center and we saw, um, well, even just in my experience as a grad student, um, I did so much better on my exams when I was able to like take them from home and just like, well, we were able to have them as like open, no, and collaborate with other students. Um, but I understand like the perspective from professors of, if you give someone else a flexibility, then they may have more time to study versus other students. And I just don't know where you guys stand in terms of our exams in general, just even a good <laughs> measure of students' knowledge. I am, I am fighting to answer this question. I hate exams. Um, and, and from, from a lot of different ways, I think, uh, what are we actually testing by testing our students? Um, what is the actual learning objective by having an exam? 
Um, I, I facilitate our exam prep group for our certification exam. And uh, we don't train on the knowledge. We train on how to take exams because it is a tricky exam. Like, what, what are we learning now? So, like I said, do you have an hour? Um, but I think it depends on the program and it depends on the student. Um, it depends on the style of exam. Are we just regurgitating memorized information? Is that what we need to do? Uh, a chemist needs to memorize equations. <laughs> I'm rehab, don't look at me like I just said something silly, because I probably did. But what are we testing with those exams and how flexible do we need them? Um, I think that would be my, my big question, realizing I'm fully biased anti-exam. So when I do offer, I don't do final or midterms, and I think we none of us actually do. Um, but for example, for my undergrad class, when I do have like quizzes, uh, it's 10 questions and it's two hours. Like the accommodation's already built in. So that, and I do, with that being said, I do still honor. So meaning that if I already created a two hour quiz for 10 questions, um, if you do have accommodations for a time and a half, then you get three hours. But I do, I would say we all do our best to build in, once again, universally design our quizzes and exams to, to meet the needs of everybody. And then, of course, honor the accommodations as necessary. So, and just to clarify, so we we figure out how much how long we believe that quiz will take, and then give two times. So if we think it's a, going to be a thirty minute exam, we give you know an hour, hour and a half, and then also give those accommodations um, the time and a half, two hours, because that's they're right. That's 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 what it is. So, sorry, one more question. Um, it's hard to pick one question. Uh, does, does any org on campus outreach to all the units, schools, divisions, et cetera, to identify programming that may be ableist or accept complaints from staff and students? Oh, there's lots of hands in, in the room. Um, I mean, my, my go-to is just reaching out to McBurney and saying, help me. Um, but who, someone. Hi, something new that we have in tandem with McBurney is a disability cultural center. Um, I'm the program coordinator. We provide training. We provide programming for students, staff, and faculty across campus. Um, so please reach out to us. Um, and we're, you know, doing that in collaboration with folks from the McBurney Center. So. Just one thing to add to that, if you feel like something is like ableist and or, and you, or you're being discriminated against or appear as being discriminated against, please submit like a bias report to the Office of Compliance so that they can review what's going on. Um, on the off you can find that report on the Office of Compliance's website. I do not have the URL memorized. Thank you both so much. A quick one. I think we have like 45 seconds. Uh, someone had asked um, if this presentation was going to be part of a bigger research project. Oh, that's a great question. I think it's just kind of all four of us, our passion, um, and it's it will likely continue just in our endeavors. Um, but this is also kind of our last hurrah in our in our program. And if I talk more, I'll start crying. Um, but this is yeah. So not officially, but probably. Um, so. For anybody else in the room who likes book recommendations or continued learning, we have a slide on some of our key um, books and literature that we're pulling from, like the Academic Ableism book, um, Discrit, Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks, so many. And I assume you'll have access to these slides later today when they're uploaded on the Diversity Forums website. But I just wanted to highlight that these are in our presentation as well. Thank you all for listening um, and asking amazing questions. You have no idea what an honor it is to be presenting here as students. Um, so thank you so much.